With recent news of Andre Karpathy taking an approximately four-month sabbatical from Tesla, there has been a lot of rumors about him potentially leaving and this being a transition. I want to talk about that issue in today's video, but more importantly, I want to talk a little bit about an article that Dr. Karpathy brought up in a recent tweet. Let's take a look. And for those of you interested in investing, check out Webull, an amazing platform for buying and selling stocks, and now cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Dogecoin, and others. Open an account and get a free stock valued at up to $200, and fund your account and get another free stock valued at up to $1,600. Check out the link in the description and help the channel at the same time. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. So first of all, I know I'm back in my like <laughs> desk studio thing because I want to share the screen here. People really complain about this. I'm doing my best. I have two completely different setups and I just need to spend more money on a better camera, I guess. So anyway, I'm working on it. I'm trying. In the meantime, just bear with me. I'm doing the best I can. So anyway, let's start off with what's going on with Dr. Karpathy. Uh, Elon Musk actually brought it up first in a tweet and said that Dr. Karpathy is taking an approximately four-month sabbatical. Andre, of course, confirmed that and said that he's traveling through Europe and Asia and doing, I think, kind of an around the world tour. And as he said a couple of days ago, a number of people asked, I am doing a digital nomad trip, packed up in one backpack and going east, saying hi to friends along the way and reading papers and writing code. Currently in the United Kingdom, continuing to Europe, Asia, and wrapping around back to the Bay Area. So first, what a cool trip. I love the idea of just being in a backpack and going, and I assume he's just got a couple of changes of clothes and a laptop, and he'll do some hiking and visit friends and coat up, you know. <laughs> it's kind of a fantasy trip for those of us who work in this thing, and you know, all the pressure and all of that stuff. So anyway, that's what Musk and Carpathy have said. That's the only facts that we have. People are freaking out, going like, oh my gosh, he's leaving, and that's what's going to happen, and they're just transitioning him out of that. I would say that the term sabbatical indicates very, very strongly to me that this is not, in fact, the case. If you know anything about it, sabbaticals generally have come about from academic environments where you work. Sabbatical means every seventh, right? <laughs> That's why the Sabbath day, you know, it's, it's from the, the Hebrew. And basically, it means that every seven years, you're supposed to get some time off. Like you're, for every six years you work, you're supposed to get one year off. Sort of like for every six days that you work, you're supposed to get one day off in the Judeo-Christian tradition. So anyway, that's where that term comes from historically, but more to the point, a sabbatical almost always requires that you go back to your place of employment for at least one more year or some period of time post sabbatical. So if Elon Musk and Andre Karpathy had said, I'm on vacation, then yeah, then maybe what you could say is, yeah, this is some sort of like transitional phase to get him out of that. But a sabbatical actually has some, I don't know if you want to call it legal requirements, but I think it actually kind of is legal requirements. I mean, obviously you could make an argument that, yeah, I went on sabbatical and then I decided to go someplace else. But the company, I believe, could actually sue you for not coming back to work with them. So I think there are some legal repercussions when you call something a sabbatical that you do have to return to your place of work. So just using that term alone indicates to me that we are not dealing with a situation where Carpathy is transitioning out. Now, could he eventually transition out to go to another place to potentially become a CEO or a CTO or something like that of his own company, absolutely that could happen. On the other hand, I don't know what startup companies are going to have access to the funding and things like Dojo, which Dr. Karpathy actually mentioned having access to already. Check out my video about that if you're interested in that, and I'll probably put that at the end of this video as well. But anyway, he talked about that, and you know, so you've got access to incredible hardware super clusters and things that most startup companies would just only dream about having. And of course, in addition, he's not just working on full self-driving, but I assume on the Tesla bot as well. So these seem to be appealing projects that would keep one active and interested in working for a given company for a long period of time. Clearly, he's worked for Tesla for five years, so he gets along with Elon Musk well enough. You know, <laughs> I think people generally wash out after a few months if they're going to wash out because they're going to be like, nope, just can't get along with it, can't deal with the hours, etc. So, so anyway, I don't have any concerns that Carpathy is leaving anytime soon. If he might leave in five years or something, yes, I think that's a completely reasonable thing that, I mean, honestly, he could just retire because probably at that point he would have enough stock put aside and Tesla stock would be good enough and, you know, he would have made enough money that he would probably be set for life. So he could just retire, but he doesn't seem like the kind of person who would want to. So I could see him transitioning to starting another company or working with another company in something like five years, but I don't foresee that happening at the end of this sabbatical. 
Of course, when we get to the beginning of August or so, and he is expected back at Tesla, then we will see, but I'm predicting no problems. He's gonna come back, he'll be refreshed and have really cool new ideas. All right, so enough of that. Let's talk about this interesting paper here. This is Training Compute Optimal Large Language Models, and Andre Carpathy says, new small language model chinchilla, which has 70 billion parameters, outperforms much larger gopher at 280 billion parameters, GPT-3 at 175 billion parameters, Jurassic 1, 178 billion parameters, and MTNLG, 530 billion parameters, which is, holy crap, 530 billion parameters. I did not know about that one. I was like, whoa, that is a big, big neural network model. He goes on to say, important new large model scaling laws paper from DeepMind, who, if you don't know, are the people who developed AlphaFold and AlphaGo and a bunch of other things. Really, really brilliant people working in this area. As he says, go smaller, train longer, many misconfigurations likely continue to lurk. And then in response to somebody who said, so basically it's like you just leave it alone and forget that you're running it and you come back and you're like, oh crap, it's actually there and it's trained better. Carpathy says, it's not that. These models are so expensive to train that you have to guess the quote scaling laws by studying smaller models, extrapolate that out and make your best guess at optimal mega model training configuration. Then you cross your fingers and train for a few weeks slash months. And if you don't already know, training these large scale models is not as simple as firing up a couple of computers and running it. It is really expensive. OpenAI, when they train GPT-3, it cost them $5 million to do that. So, so these are, you know, these training runs, if you don't get them right, it, there's a serious expense and cost, not just in money, but also in time, because it could take weeks or months to train these models up. And if you don't get it right, then you have to start all over again and figure out what was wrong. So, so this is a significant problem, not something that I have an issue with. I don't deal with models of this size. So, so I don't know firsthand. I mean, these kind of numbers of billions of parameters are kind of mind blowing. All right, so let's look at this paper quickly. I'm just gonna focus kind of on the beginning and the end. Of course, I will leave a link in the description if you're that kind of person. It's 34 or 35 pages long. It's very, very long, very, very detailed. Excellent paper, I highly recommend it, but obviously for this channel, I'm not going to focus on the guts of this thing. I'm just going to look at the conclusions that they come to. You can see, of course, that there are many, many authors for this paper, so good for them. And it's called Training Compute Optimal Large Language Models. All right, so let's read over the abstract. We investigate the optimal model size and number of tokens for training a transformer language model under a given compute budget. We find that current large language models are significantly undertrained, a consequence of the recent focus on scaling language models whilst keeping the amount of training data constant. By training over 400 language models ranging from 70 million to over 16 billion parameters on five to 500 billion tokens, we find that for compute optimal training, the model size and the number number of training tokens should be scaled equally. For every doubling of model size, the number of training tokens should also be doubled. We test this hypothesis by training a predicted compute optimal model, Chinchilla, that uses the same compute budget as Gopher, but with 70 billion parameters and four times more data. Chinchilla uniformly and significantly outperforms Gopher at 280 billion parameters, GPT-3 at 175 billion parameters, Jurassic 1 at 178 billion parameters, and Megatron Turing NLG at 530 billion parameters on a large range of downstream evaluation tasks. This also means that Chinchilla uses substantially less compute for fine tuning and inference, greatly facilitating downstream usage. As a highlight, Chinchilla reaches a state-of-the-art average accuracy of 67.5% on the MMLU benchmark greater than a 7% improvement over Gopher. All right, so that is a mouthful. Here is the important takeaway that I've highlighted in blue. For every doubling of model size, the number of training tokens, in other words, the data that you use, should also be doubled. That's the big takeaway from this thing, is that essentially what we've got is a whole bunch of models that are training. They're increasing the parametric size of these models, in other words, the number of parameters. Again, if you don't know, parameters are just like, if you imagine like a little uh, mixing board or something, where you're just tuning knobs, and you've got 280 billion of these knobs or something with gopher, right? So what they're saying is that rather than just keep increasing the parameter size and the number of parameters that you can tune and keeping the data size the same, 
what you're going to do is under train these things. What you need to do instead is use a smaller model. And again, it's not very small. It's 70 billion parameters still. It's absolutely monstrous, but it's way, way, way smaller than these other ones. But what you need to do is scale up your data instead. So that is their main takeaway from this whole thing is that what you need to do is instead of just continuing to increase the parametric size of your models, you need to increase your data in lockstep with your model size increases. All right, jumping down to letter G of their article, I just wanted to call out this one little thing. This is really interesting. Gopher was trained with Adam, while Chinchilla is trained with Adam W. So Adam is an optimizer, and I didn't realize that Adam W actually could perform better, so that's rather interesting that there is a new, even better version of an optimizer that's out there. Not a big deal for those of you if you don't care about this kind of stuff, but I thought that was really cool and that they actually are using Adam W as an optimizer here. All right, and then we get to a table, everybody's favorite thing in the world. These are all text-based data sets, but you can see that Chinchilla, the way that they trained it, the bold face means that it outperformed all of the other systems for those particular tasks. And by the way, of course, they could have had the table extend because they could have had GPT-3 and other things in there as well. But what they did was they just pulled out the three that had a result that beat the other ones. So Gopher was sort of state of the art before, which is why it's there. And you can also see that Jurassic won on two categories categories, DM Mathematics, and Ubuntu IRC, which is a text-based sort of chat room kind of thing, big giant data sets of language stuff. So anyway, but for most of these things, for most of the data sets, it outperformed and actually only underperformed on the mathematics by a tiny bit. The Ubuntu IRC, interestingly enough, it really underperformed in that area. But overall, Chinchilla has beat out these other things by training on a larger data set for longer. And that's the interesting result of all of this. All right, so the big question question is, okay, this is really, really cool. These are really interesting results. It means that you can get away with a smaller model if you train on more data for longer. But what does this actually have to do with Tesla and why would somebody like Andre Carpathy care? Except, of course, that he just finds all of this stuff fascinating as I do. Well, for Tesla, let's think about this. Big models are complicated to deploy on hardware like Hardware 3, right? They have to refactor these gigantic models that they have, these huge neural network models. They have to squeeze them down to fit on the mobile hardware that is in your car when you're driving around on full self-driving. So that's number one. The fewer parameters you have, the better because it's easier to refactor. Number two, if you just build these gigantic models and you don't train them well enough, they underperform. In other words, they need more training time. They need more data to train on. It's not enough to create something with bigger and bigger parameters. You have to throw more and more data at it. Who in the world of self-driving or autonomous driving has the most data? <laughs> Hint, that would be Tesla because they have millions of cars on the road collecting data every single day. So smaller model, more data, better than bigger model, less data. All of that stuff plays directly into the hands of Tesla. And I think the important thing to realize here is whether Carpathian team have recognized this yet, they now do recognize what they should be doing is keeping their model size the same or reducing it and just training on more and more and more data, which you know probably they already are, but they've essentially got proof. And again, this is from language models, but data is data. So vision models are gonna work mo more or less the same. But basically this paper gives them proof that a, a smaller, more efficient, more lean model with more data and more training time is the better way to go. So I expect that what that's going to do is cause them to rethink a little bit how big their models need to be and how long they need to train these models for. So I think that's the practical outcome that could come out of this. I think what we would see as drivers of full self-driving is that we might see models potentially eventually that either stay the same size or even reduce a little bit in size in training and are trained on more data for longer instead of for bigger models that are trained on less data for shorter times and that we will see things that are easier to refactor and put into our cars, which may actually help the whole situation with hardware three and how close to the limits hardware three is right now. So of course I have no evidence that Tesla as an entity, as a business has thought about all of these things yet, but it does seem like a paper that really, really points up the advantages that Tesla has in terms of being able to create autonomous driving software. And I think that's really cool. And I thank you to Andre for posting this paper because I wouldn't have seen it otherwise more than likely. And also I think it's really worth exploring and thinking about the specific effect that a paper like this could have on Tesla and on us as full self-driving customers. 
customers. All right, I hope you enjoyed this video and found it fun and interesting and a little bit thought provoking. If you did, please do like it because that's how YouTube's algorithm knows to show it to other people. And of course, consider subscribing for more of this kind of content. As always, a huge shout out to my patrons on Patreon. Thank you all so much for your support. I am really looking forward to meeting a whole bunch of you in Austin next week. Gosh, it's coming up really, really soon. Anyway, if you want to join the team, definitely check out the link in the description and sign up on Patreon. And if you're interested in a whole bunch of really cool merch, check out our merch store. Link is in the description. We have Tesla bot t-shirts, the Tesla meme t-shirt, success is a possible outcome, 4680 battery cells. All of that stuff is on t-shirts, mugs, tumblers, and on and on. So check it out. And for those of you interested in investing, check out Webull, an amazing platform for buying and selling stocks and now cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Dogecoin, and others. Open an account and get a free stock valued at up to $200 and fund your account and get another free stock valued at up to $1,600. Check out the link in the description and help the channel at the same time. Thank you. And finally, don't forget, we are both Tesla and Amazon affiliates. If you look in the description, you can see how going shopping for a solar roof, a power wall, or anything on Amazon helps out the channel. In the meantime, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.